So we, I was going to talk about um, about some stuff with the Bible, and I, and, I, and I was thinking about it and praying about it, and I really felt like God was saying, you know, focus on focus on the things, you know, because sometimes we tell people to read the Bible, and we don't really tell them how to read the Bible. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it can get sometimes a little confusing, I think, and so I, I really felt like, um, you know, maybe some clarity was good. Uh, so the first step to, to how to understand the Bible is pick a translation. Now, people will tell you this, that, and the other thing, but the truth is that every translation is going to be a little bit inadequate. And that's because you, if you translate directly, word for word, there's going to be some things that just don't make sense. You know, because how we talk has changed. And so, like, there's idioms and stuff, and, you know, they have certain ways of talking in the Greek that don't really carry over into the English. So you really can't be too precise because people won't really understand what you're saying. But then, if you go to paraphrased about the idea, you, if you try to just make it overly simple, then you get kind of far away from the text. So you have this problem about, well, so what translation should you do? And I'm not, I'm not somebody who's going to tell you what translation you should use, but I'm going to give you some options, okay? The first one I would like to advise is called English Standard Version. Um, it was put out, I believe, in 2008 or 2006. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's a very good translation, but it, it's very... Um, the grammar is very high, you know. It's it, so if you don't, it, if you're like most people and, and you're not a grad school student, you might not benefit from this one. But it is very literal. It is very close to the uh, original Greek manuscripts and the original Hebrew and Aramaic manuscripts. Okay, it's it's very, very literal. Another good one is called the New American Standard Bible. This is actually the one that um, pastor preaches from. Um, it, it's, it's very literal. Um, it, it used to be the most literal. I don't know if it still is or not, but that was its big selling point, the most literal translation of the Bible. That means it's as close to the Greek manuscripts as you can get before you read the Greek manuscripts. <laughs> so um, it, as far as what level, it's more of a high school, college level. It, some things in it are a little bit difficult to understand. Um, another translation I would advise is called the Christian Standard Bible. This translation actually just came out last year. Um, it's paraphrased. What that means is it seeks to make things clear over than exact. Does that make sense? So in, it, whereas in the ESV it might be a little bit confusing what it's saying, the CSB just tries to say it in a simpler, easier way. Um, I've read through it, and it's, it's, it's you know, it's, I, I, I actually really like it. Um, Chuck actually used it last Sunday night, um, so if you liked the translation he was reading from, it was this. Um, it was really written for everyone. The, the grammar in it is very, very easy to understand. You're not going to find a bunch of big, scary words in there. Just real <coughs> plain and straightforward. Um, another one which has gotten a very bad rep but um, has been re-released is called the New International Version. Um, it, it was kind of like a, a joke among people who actually knew what the Bible says because they would just take out verses. They would randomly change words for no reason. They'd be like, ah, whatever, let's change this around. You know, just butcher, butcher the Bible, uh, and, uh, and it was last released in the 80s, I would believe 84, and so it was kind of a joke, but then it got bought out and re-released in 2011, um, <laughs> and it still has the bad rep because they didn't change the name, it's still called New International Version, so you have to look, if you buy it, go to buy it, you have to look on the copyright pages at the very front to see if it t says 2011 on it. So uh, it's also a paraphrase. It's not as literal as the Christian Standard Bible. It's it's not quite the New Living, but <laughs> it, it's it's not very it's not very literal. Um, it focuses its its main point is, is to be clear. So um, if you want something in between literal and paraphrase, the CSB is a very good choice. Um, if you want something as literal as possible, I would highly recommend the NASB. The ESV is just sometimes a little bit too complicated. Unless you have a really good vocabulary, then go for it. Um, so the second step is read it. I, I, a lot of times we, we, we make the Bible real complicated, we don't understand it, and we want somebody to explain it to us before we read it. But uh, a lot of times if we just read it, it kind of explains itself as, as we get used to it. The problem is, is the Bible is not like other books. And so we read it thinking it's going to be like, you know, uh, I don't know, a, a, Gr a Grisham novel or something, and, and, and it's not like that. You know, it, it's different than all the things that we have. Plus... It's thousands of years old, <laughs> so it's going to be a little bit difficult to understand your first time, a couple times through, but then you start kind of getting the hang of it. So, 
Um, read through the Bible. Um, focus here on quantity. Read as much as possible. You know, read it through in a year. Uh, it's really a good idea just to get an idea of what's in there. Okay? But then uh, it's also a good idea to, while you're reading it through, reading as much as possible, qu uh, a quantity, to do a quality study. Pick out certain parts and just study in that part. Really pick it apart and look at what it has to say. You know, just to kind of slow down, think about what you said, I mean, what you've read. Um, if you read it every day, it's a lot easier. If anybody's ever lear uh, learned an instrument, like guitar or something, it's easier to pick up on it if you practice it every day. If you try to learn the guitar and only practice it once, you know, a week or two, chances are you're not going to get the hang of it. Um, uh, think about what you've read throughout the day. This is, this is a word called meditation, but it's kind of gotten... Um, some people have kind of taken it to a weird place because of, you know, New Age and Hinduism and that kind of stuff. And it's not like that. The biblical idea of meditation is, is thinking on it, you know, keeping it in, in your mind while, throughout the day. You know, what you've read, uh, stop and think about it instead of just oh, glowing reflection. through it. Reflection. There's a, there's a good word, reflection. Um, actually, I think that's the word that the, like the newer devotional stuff is, is using. You know, they'll have like a reflect section. Um, memorize parts. You know, go through and just start memorizing stuff. Uh, memorize just one <clears throat> verse, and then memorize just another. Don't focus on reading, memorizing the whole chapter. Just memorize a little bit, and then you can get it. Because a lot of people say this: I can't memorize it. I, I've tried; I just can't. Okay, well, let's 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 break it down to a more manageable piece. Okay, John one one. In the beginning was the Word. Okay, so let's try something smaller. In the beginning, in the beginning. In the beginning. See what I mean? And just focus on those small pieces and then start putting those small pieces together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. See what I mean? You can start picking those little pieces together. You're not going to be able to memorize 15 verses all at once, but you just memorize what you can. And this helps you to remember what's in the Word, and it helps you apply what is in the Word. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, then the st step three is observe. So we, step one was pick a translation. Make sure you actually understand what you're reading. I can give you a, a translation of the Bible in you know, Russian, but if you don't speak Russian, it's not going to do you any good. <laughs> you see what I mean? Pick a translation you understand. And uh, what I find helpful is start on a less literal translation just so you get the idea of what's in the word. And then as you start understanding it, then go to a more literal, literal translation. Just so you kind of get your bearings. You know what I mean? Um, so then step two was to just read it. And step three is observe. Observe what you're reading. Um, as you read it, ask yourself questions about what you read. Is it poetry? Is it history? Is it prophetic? If you're reading in the book of Psalms, for instance, it's going to use images, not literal words. You see what I mean? I, let me say it differently. Um, it's going to use wordings that aren't to be taken literal. It's, you know, they're songs. You know, it's meant to be more of a poetical. You, you know what I'm saying. Like, when you read poetry from, you know, the greats in literature classes, do they say everything plain and blunt? This is this. No, they say it in a, in a flowing way. Well, it's the same, same way with the Bible. So you have to kind of, different parts that you're reading, you have to think about it differently. Whereas a history part, those parts are actually happening. So you have to look at it as though it's not a myth or it's not a, a poetry. It's something that actually happened. King Solomon actually built a temple in Jerusalem. See what I mean? King David was actually the king of Israel. See what I mean? Just different parts like that. Is it prophetic? Like, this kind of goes without saying, but when you read the prophetic books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they're going to use um, a lot of stuff about telling the future. They're going to say a lot of stuff about um, telling the sins of the people. They're going to use a lot of things about um, they're going to use some poetry in with their prophecy. So you just have to kind of see what is this trying to say. Okay? Um, this, the, the next thing there, ask questions about who you just, what you just read. Who was this to? When this was written originally, who did they write it to? What, what, was, what was going on there? Um, who wrote it? Who was the person actually writing it to that person? You know, like if I read the book, the book of Romans, for instance. Well, it's easy to know who it goes to because it's called who it goes to. It was written to the church in Rome. Okay, that's easy. So who wrote it? Well, Paul. Okay. So what was the situation? Well, there was a problem between the Jews and, and the Greeks in the church because some of the Jews thought that they had a, a more important role in the church and some of the Greeks thought that the Jews didn't matter at all. So you had this conflict between these two groups of people and so Paul wrote to help bring unity between the two. 
Well, that really helps you understand what's, what you're reading, right? And uh, these are things that you can kind of get from the Bible itself if you just study it. Um, what was their point in writing this? You know, what's the main point? You know, sometimes we get really bogged down with the details that we're reading, but we don't understand what's the main point of what's going on here. You know, like you read in 1 Samuel, and okay, what is going on here? You've got this king that's trying to kill this, this guy that's just trying to play an instrument. I mean, what's going on there? So, I mean, you get kind of the theme of what's going on here. Um, what, and, oh, I just said it in the same thing. Look at that. Uh, what is before and after what I'm reading? Don't focus too much on just one verse. Focus on the section that that verse is in. You know what I mean? Like everybody knows Romans 8.28. Uh, for God... Uh, brain fart. God works all things together uh, for the good, right? Of those who believe. According... And it goes on like that. But you get the man to do what I'm saying. I don't want to get too far off topic here. But uh, everybody knows that part. But what is he talking about there? See what I mean? You study the whole passage, the whole paragraph... And you start to understand the idea of what he's saying. Um, a lot of times we misunderstand what's in, the, what's in the Word because we don't actually read the whole thing. We just kind of skim through, not really paying attention while we're reading. Then we hit a verse that we really like, and then we circle that one, and then we just kind of ignore everything around it. You know, Like one that, I, that I, a lot of the uh, high schoolers around here um, do is uh, Matthew 7, uh, verse 1, where it says, uh, do not judge. Right. So that means that you know, hey, everybody should just live however the heck they want, right? But if you read all around it, it's, it says about, okay, he's talking about being a condemning person, which is funny because a lot of, a lot of times we do that. We are condemning people, you know what I mean? Like, the, people can't be good enough for us. We point out everything they do wrong. We have our favorite sins. Those are worse than everything else, right? Homosexuality, that's, that's the ultimate worst sin you can do, right? And if we see any, anyone who's that, that's just, there's no grace there. But then, you know, this person... Uh, I don't know, looked at pornography. Ah, that's fine, whatever. You know what I mean? We let some sins slide and we get real condemning on other sins. You know, and that's just not really what the Bible has to say. Um, so just kind of understanding the whole passage and what's going on there. Uh, we do not create meaning. We find meaning. Creating meaning says this. Well, this is what this means to me. I'm going to completely ignore what it actually said and I'm just going to make it apply however I want it to apply. I've created a meaning from the Bible. But... That's not how the Bible is meant to be read. We find what the Bible meant, and then we apply it to our lives. Does that kind of make sense? So let's say, for instance, Paul says in Philippians, you know, I can do anything that Christ strengthens me through, right? I can do all things through Christ, right? So I, that means I, I can just rise above anything. I'm going to get this working out thing done. And in fact, it's often used for working out. But the truth is, if you read the whole idea of what he said there, he said... I've learned how to trust in God. I can, I can have a lot. I can have a little. I can, I can be in these disastrous situations. I can be in good situations. It's going to be okay. And, I, and, I, and this is why. And this is my secret here. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When God brings us to something, he brings us through that something. That's what he's saying. He's not saying, if I just put my mind to it, I can rise above any obstacle. No, he's saying, I find my strength in Christ. Christ will get me through what he's brought me to. That's what, it, that's what the main point is. We find the meaning and then we apply it to us. So that means that, you know, like that song says um, that we played a couple weeks ago, uh, you know, when, when things are going wrong, when my kids get sick, when, when I lose my job, when I'm losing my house, I'm, I don't know if you guys remember when we played that song, but, you know, when all these bad things are happening, I'll trust in the name of Jesus, right? That was the idea of it. And, and really the same idea there. We find the meaning of what it's saying and then we apply that meaning to our lives. Um, so that takes us to the last step, applying. Um, though verses only have one meaning, okay, they apply to our specific lives in different ways. Okay? Every verse only has one meaning. What the author originally meant when he wrote it to whoever he was writing it to. That's what it means. We don't create a meaning, that's what it means. right? If I write a love letter to Gracie, you can then say, this is a word of prophecy that, no, it's not. It was a love letter to my wife. Well, I, that's, that's good for you if you want to see it that way, but I see it a little bit differently. I think it's about a dog that was struggling to find his way home. It's like, wait, what? No, it was a love letter to my wife. See, I mean, you find the meaning that is actually there. And verses only have one meaning. But those meanings apply to our lives in different ways. 
For instance, um, Exodus uh, chapter 20, like verse 3, says this, You shall have no other gods beside me. And in the, in the English, it's kind of hard to understand what he's saying. What that word beside means, it actually means you can't own idols, you can't worship other gods, you can't even be connected with, with the cult. Oh, even if you go to a pagan sacrifice and don't take part, you're not even supposed to be there. That's what that word means. You have no other gods besides me. So then, nowadays, Christians do things like we own you know, Ouija boards, we own dream catchers, we own Buddha dolls in our houses. There are no other gods besides me. So this is how it applies. Get the stuff out of your house. See what I mean? That's what the word means. Now, how does it apply to you? See what I mean? But what we do oftentimes is we kind of... We like what we're doing, and we don't want to have to change. But then we want God to bless us, and then we want to be a good Christian... And every good Christian has to read their Bible, right? So we read the Bible, but then we don't really apply it. And it's like James says, it's like somebody who goes and looks at a mirror and then forgets what they look like. You know, they haven't applied it to their lives. Um, actually, I have that written down there. Don't worship owner or serve, uh, or serve God. See, what we do is, I'm not worshiping another God, but then we're still paying tribute to it. So it's like, well, I'm confused. You know what I mean? Like, even, you could even go a step further. You could even say practices that are seen as not a big deal, like water witching. You know? Things that are seen as not a big deal, like, um, I don't know, uh, doing certain rituals to bring rain. You know what I mean? These, these things that people oftentimes just think, that's not a big deal. Well, it, it kind of is, though. So, um, sermons help you do this. If you stay connected with the church, it really does help this process. Um, I personally have always um, tried to just stay connected to one church for a few reasons. The first reason is because it's easier to actually get involved and get connected with people if you only go to one church. Now, I'm not saying you have to do this. I'm saying this is what worked for me. Um, I, it, it's a lot easier to kind of flow with the church. You know what direction they're going. You know, um, I know some people uh, who go to like four or five churches, and I mean, I'm not condemning that. If they want to do that, that's fine. Um, I have a really hard time because each different church is going in a different direction. And, you know, you're trying to get plugged into these four or five, but you don't know the direction, so you're just kind of wandering spiritually. Now, you can do it. You know, I'm not saying that anything. I can't do it. I have a hard time doing that. This is also why I don't even bother with televangelists, because I have enough time, you know, Finding time to do the things I'm supposed to be doing. I don't have any time to listen to people to see if they are if they are actually teaching what's in the Bible, and then to see if, if what they say actually applies to me. It's, I don't have the time for that. I really don't. I mean, I got so many other things to do. But some people do like watching televangelists. So, not all parts of the Bible tell me what I should do. Some parts tell me who God is. You're going to have a really hard time. Reading through the in numbers where it talks about the genealogies and all the different people, this was the son of this, and saying this is what I should do from that. You can have a really hard time with that. I'm not saying that people haven't tried to do that, but it's very difficult to do that because that's not what its intended meaning is. You know? um, or in Exodus, when he's talking about how they're constructing the tabernacle, you're going to have a really hard time taking a this is what I should do from that. The Bible doesn't always tell us things that we should do. It tells us things about God, things about life, you know, things about the situations and whatnot. So, now I'm going to go to a few specific examples and how to apply the Bible in those examples. But before I do that, are there any questions about what I've said? Because if you didn't understand that part, you're not going to understand the applicational parts. Okay. Well, one, one thing I'd just like to mention also... If you're not born again and you're reading the Bible, it says that the preaching and or the understanding of the word is unto them that are lost. It's foolishness. Yeah. So it's not going to make sense if you've got friends that say, you know, I tried to read that and it just totally full of contradicts itself. Yeah. But unto us that are saved, it is the power of God. So it's only going to make sense to some people. Yeah, I mean, that, that's I would, I would totally agree with that. The Bible itself says that, you know. Um, three different people can read it and get three different things because one reads it, reads it as a not saved person, one reads it as a saved person, and one reads it as a mature saved person. So, I mean, like the pastor was saying, I think it was last, no, it could have been last Sunday, uh, I guess last Wednesday maybe, 
God talks to us in different ways as we grow spiritually. So you could read one passage and it touches you here and it speaks to you here, and then you grow and five, ten years later, um, you know, not to say that you didn't read it again for five or ten years, I'm not saying that at all, but uh, yeah, right, and you're, you're reading it and it's like, oh, I didn't even realize it said that. See what I mean? So, uh, any, any questions then? Okay, so this is what you would do. You would take a question, for instance, and, and you go to the Bible. Should I smoke pot? Well, if anybody here has read the Bible, you know that the Bible doesn't say anything about marijuana. So you're left with a little bit of a conundrum. First off, you can piece together pieces from what the you can piece together parts of what the Bible says. First, well, is it legal? If you do not have a prescription for it, then that means it's illegal for you to do. So no, you should not do it. Because the Bible tells us to respect or to obey the government, right? See what I mean? Okay, so then you go to the next question. Does it master me? If you are addicted to something, you should probably give it up. And don't get too caught up on, on what I'm saying there. What I'm saying, the Holy Spirit will kind of lead you to things one at a time. He won't, he won't have you try and give up everything all at once. You know? But he'll, he'll specifically lay on your heart when you should give something up. Like a bad attitude that you've had towards someone your whole life. Or um, real short temper. You know, sometimes God will push us to, to, to deal with those things, and we try and deal with everything that we see in our lives all at once, and it just doesn't really work like that. So the third step, uh, how will it affect others? 1 Corinthians 10, 24, I actually want to read this one. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. <clears throat> Sometimes things are just so good, you can't really say it's there. You've got to read it and let it speak for itself. That's just good. Don't be a self-absorbed Christian. You know, a lot of these televangelists that are, that are talking now, they're all talking about how you can be happier in life, how you can make your life all about you, how you can you know, have peace in your heart, and how you can... You know, all this stuff that's all about us. It's all us focused. It's not how can I love God better. It's not how can I love people better. And not how can I understand his word. How can I pray more fervently. It's how can I make myself perfectly happy while I ignore all the people who are mad at me. And I don't solve, resolve conflicts. And I don't resolve the bitterness in my heart. And I let my short temper go. You know, so it really is there. Um, would Jesus do it? And does it glorify God? Which is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 10, 34, 31. So whatever you do, um, do it to the glory of God. Um, so th there's another question there. And does it affect my frame of mind? First Peter 5, 8 to 9, which I'm going to read this one too. 5, 8 to 9. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, uh, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that uh, the same kinds of suffering uh, are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So there we have another thing. Does it affect my frame of mind? Is it, is it affecting me? So once you go through all these things, most of the time, uh, at least in this area, people smoke pot because they want to smoke pot. It has nothing to do with medical needs. Now I'm not talking about people who use it for, for cancer or those kind of things. I'm not even commenting on that one way or another. All that I'm saying is a lot of times, you know, we do things like smoke, smoke pot, drink, and these are things that are not good for us and they're having a negative effect. Um, I, I, I can only just push past this negative effect on our body and, you know, um, you know, and, and so, yeah. Uh, so unless for specific medical reasons, you can deduce that the Bible says, no, I probably shouldn't do that. Let's look at how you can do a specific passage. I'm kind of running a little late. Yeah. And I don't want to make that the whole night. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Now, everybody says that this is about marriage, but he doesn't specifically say this is only about marriage, does he? So then, let's say, for instance, somebody was wanting to be, join the Freemasons. This is just throwing this out there, okay? If it'll go. There. I shouldn't join the Freemasons since I would be binding myself to unbelievers. With the Freemasons, you have to take blood oaths, very, very deep, very, very deep oaths that you have to take with people who aren't all Christians. 
to go beyond that, Freemasonry is borderline cultic. So you have quite a few problems that arise with that. Um, and so then, you know, this would be a good example of how you could apply this passage. No, I shouldn't join the Freemasons because I shouldn't be unequally yoked. That's a specific example. I'm not saying that's the only example you could get, application you could get from that text. Another one would be, hey, don't, don't date non-Christians. That's probably a good idea because if you date somebody, you, you might, there's a chance you might marry them. Besides that, you know, why toy around with something that you're not serious with anyways? You know, uh, another good example, well, I think that's enough good example of that. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm hoping you're getting what I'm saying. I'm trying to draw specific applications from these passages so that you can see how to do it for yourselves. You know, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. I was talking to the uh, worship team the other day and I said this. The most of the time that we hear people making life decisions, they don't say, it says in the Bible, they say, I felt like God was telling me. My, my emotions tell me that this is what God is saying. But what does the word say? You know, oh, well, God told me to get a divorce. God told me to get married. God told me to do this. God told me to quit my job. God told me to... God doesn't tell people to do those kinds of things. Like, <laughs> he doesn't speak like that, okay? <laughs> this is what he says. This is how you should respond in this situation. And this is how you should not be, not be bitter. In 1 Peter, for instance, he's talking about a wife who is mistreated. Or is that saying Peter? No, 1 Peter. I believe it's 1 Peter. He's talking about a wife who is mistreated. And then he says this, basically, um, how she should endure, how she should be a good, good, good reflection of God, how she basically goes on and on about encouraging her doing the right thing, even in spite of her husband treating her wrong. And then he goes on in the next verse to say this, as for you husbands, if you mistreat your wives, God isn't even going to hear your prayers. So he addresses that too, but the, a lot of times in the Bible, he more addresses how to respond in situations. Did you know in the Old Testament, slavery was not condemned. Rather, God told people how to correctly treat each other. How to love their neighbor. Now, to us nowadays, that's a little bit of a, ah, my mind is blown from the idea that somebody could be a slave and still love like a brother. Once again, different culture, not even getting into that. But the idea is, sometimes the Bible won't necessarily say the what's the perfect ideal in any situation. Rather, the how you should respond in that situation. You know what I mean? Because a lot of times, as spouses, we won't treat our spouses well. As pastors, we won't treat our congregation well. As a congregation, we won't treat each other well. Sometimes we make mistakes, right? So with that being said, the Bible teaches us how to resolve those issues. So 1 Corinthians 5, 9-11 says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and swindlers, uh, or idolaters, since then you would have need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, uh, reviler, or drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Basically, someone who's pretending to be a Christian and yet is living in, in the passions of the flesh. Uh, 6, 9 through 10 uh, kind of carries on the same thing here. Um, or do you not know that the unrighteous... Um, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Um, and he goes on like that. And so here's some things we could apply from that. If I want a good relationship with God, I can't do the things that feel right, but the things that are right. Do you know sometimes I can genuinely believe that something is right, but it's not right? You know what I mean? Sometimes we can be convinced in our minds that what we're doing is right. Well, what does the Word say? Well, if you're not reading it, you're not going to know. Uh, I need to either marry or break up with someone that I've been having sex with. That's another thing we can get from this. Because God is not pleased from us sleeping around with people. So either marry the person or break it off. That's what the Bible says. You see what I mean? Because you can't claim to be a Christian if you're doing these things that contradict what God told you to do. See what I mean? But you won't know what God told you to do if you're not reading the Bible. See what I mean? It's okay when a new Christian doesn't read the Bible. But as God speaks to you, as God draws you, as you draw near to God, he expects you to start reading his word. He gave it to you for a reason. You see what I mean? Uh, that kind of makes sense. I'm not going to really control their too I can't let America tell me what is right and wrong but God's word. If you follow the culture, homosexuality is okay. But the Bible says it's not. 
So I have to make sure that I do not let my passions and my lusts reign, but God's word reign. Does that make sense? Um, I shouldn't get involved in Ponzi schemes. A lot of people say, ah, oh, it's not that harmless. You know, we're only ripping, ripping off people who are, who are rich anyways. Well, that's not what the Bible said. Swindlers. It said that very specifically. Um, I shouldn't cheat on my taxes. Well, the government always, yes, I totally agree that the IRS is, is totally robbery. I agree on all that stuff. However, the Bible does still say to respect authority. It does still say to obey authority, so you should pay your taxes. Um, I should practice self-control when I watch TV or when I eat. Very common nowadays to have Netflix binges. And I do mean binges, where we sit there for hour upon hour watching Netflix. Now, watching Netflix isn't a sin, but when your whole life revolves around a TV show and what happens to that main character, I mean, come on. <laughs> it, is right, it is raining your life. Um, you know, we should practice self-control in these things. Galatians uh, 5, 19 through 23. says this. Now the works of the flesh are evident sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, uh, uh, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and, and things like these. So this is not exhaustive. This is just saying these kinds of things. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So some specific applications I can take from that. As a parent, I need to give my kids time out of my day. As a parent, I need to give my kids time out of my day. Another, another one, I need to instruct them with my life, with how I act, and I need to instruct them with patience. Do I need to discipline my children? Yes, but with patience. See, we think some things are just women's traits. You know, women need to do that, but men don't need to do that. Well, that's not what he said here, though. Let's look at that again. He says there, gentleness, self-control, they're at the, at the beginning of verse 23. He's not saying for women. He's saying for all y'all. These are things that you need to be practicing. Well, how many times as men do we practice gentleness? <coughs> how many times do we practice self-control? Right? If we want sex, our wife better give it to us. If our kid makes, our, makes us mad, we bend them over our knee and we smack them real good. See what I mean? Well, is that practicing self-control? Is that practicing gentleness and kindness and patience? See what I mean? You, you kind of get what I'm saying there? Mm -hmm. So, another example. Yelling and becoming angry doesn't make me a man or a woman. Oftentimes we think, I'm a man if I really show my temper, if I really show how good, big and bad I am. Well, that's not what the Bible says. It makes you a spiritual, spiritually a child. That's what the Bible says. As we grow in Christ... We're supposed to be controlling our angers, controlling our tempers, controlling our lusts, controlling these things. And how do we do that? With the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying you have the powers within you to overcome these things. But you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can rise above it. You can. Um, I shouldn't drink and drive. That would be another good application of, this verse, of these verses here. Right? Because that would be irresponsible. And a lot of times we, we justify that. We say, I'm not really drunk, I'm, I'm buzzed. Okay, well, your, reflex, your reflexes are still slowed. And uh, actually, um, I shared something on my Facebook, uh, pictures of a three-year-old who was in, a, in, a, in an accident. And she, for days, they didn't even know she, if she was going to make it or not. Um, finally today, it, she, or you no, know, it was yesterday afternoon, she started getting better. The guy who was drinking and driving... He didn't even get a scratch on him. Mm -hmm. I can tell you more stories like that. Uh, when I was in high school, one of my buddies from Royal Rangers was driving home from doing ministry. He wasn't doing anything wrong. And a drunk driver came out of nowhere, hit him, killed him, and he got away scot-free. They didn't even take away his license. Wow. See what I mean? Like, You can excuse it all you want, but it's irresponsible, it's stupid, and it's dangerous. Not just to you, to other people too. You don't know if you're going to kill somebody's kid, if you're going to kill somebody's neighbor. See what I mean? You don't know that. Or, I mean, a lot of people like their pets. You might kill somebody's pet, too. Mm -hmm. uh, I shouldn't be a, an unloving person even though I have to have standards. See, what we do oftentimes is we go to one extreme or the other. I have to live as under the law, right? You know, everything that applies in the Old Testament, I mean, it's still good, for, good enough for me today, so I have to live as I'm under the law. If it says, you know, not to shave the edges of my beard, I'm not going to shave the edges of my beard. Or we go to the other extreme, and we say, I'm saved by grace. I can do whatever I want. There is no standard anymore. If that applies to you, that's good, but it doesn't apply to me that way. Well, no, there is still a standard. 
And the Bible does still clarify the standard. That's why I said that about the verses. There is still only one meaning for that verse. There are different applications for it, but there's still just that one meaning. Okay, so at the end of the day, when you're reading the Bible, just remember this, that God is the master, not me. You are not the master of Scripture. God is the master. And then the last thing, His word is for me today. Yes, it was written thousands of years ago, and it's still for you today. Remember that. And if, if you had any problems with this, um, don't be afraid to ask. If you have problems understanding, I mean, if, you, if I made, said something that made you mad, I'm, I'm sorry, but please don't tell me about it. I've got sick kids at home. I don't want to be thinking about somebody I offended on accident. I really genuinely do not try to offend people. I do that all on accident. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, just stay in the Word. Uh, we have this online. We also have copies of it if you want to go over it again. Um, but before we close out in prayer, are there any questions that you have about the Bible? Maybe you're reading it and you just didn't understand something. Anybody? We're going to close. I'm, I'm dead for real. Okay, cool. Uh, Norva, would you mind closing us in prayer, please? Father, we just thank you for the word tonight. It's working our minds and our hearts.